So let's take a deeper dive into the 5 gigahertz frequency uh, band. And the 5 gigahertz frequency band is important to um, understand because we said that in a high density environment or in most environments where we're deploying Wi-Fi today, the 5 gigahertz is actually going to be preferred over 2.4 because A, 2.4 is already congested and B, the 2.4 only has three or four non-overlapping channels, depending on which channel scheme you're allowed to use. The um, 5 gigahertz frequency band offers more channels, um, and one of the things to note about these channels, though, is um, they will depend on the regulatory domain where you find yourself in. So in some countries, uh, you might not have the availability of all the channels you see on the screen, so please uh, refer to your lo local uh, authority to find out which channels are supported. And in terms of supporting channels, um, and in, in terms of power settings on the APs, the Extreme Cloud IQ will uh, already enforce both power output and channel selection depending on which country you're in. And you select the country uh, when you onboard, when you create your uh, instance and also you can override the country when you're actually onboarding the devices. So if you have a deployment that spans across multiple countries, in Extreme Cloud IQ you'll be able to select the country code and that country code will actually enforce the power and channel selection settings for that country. Uh, to know what those are, what those limitations are, please refer to your uh, uh, regulatory domain authority. So the 5 gigahertz uh, channel bands are Uni 1, Uni 2, Uni 3, and Uni 3, uh, Uni 2 extended, and Uni 3. And um, the channels that we have are all based on OFDM uh, modulation, which means they are spaced 20 megahertz apart. Uh, while they may not seem as overlapping, in reality, these OFDM channel masks, if you look at them closer, and if you put access points very close to each other, they actually overlap slightly. So um, one rule that you need to abide by is do not mount access points very close to each other. So this is uh, considering that the access points are spaced out uh, one from another. And the other thing to note, mainly we're talking about 20 megahertz channels. You, know, you do have the option of bonding the channels together. So by bonding channels together, every time you do that, you're basically duplicating the available bandwidth and you're duplicating the amount of traffic that you can push through that channel. So you can go from 20 megahertz to 40 megahertz, from 40 megahertz to 80 megahertz, and from 80 megahertz to 160 megahertz. Now a couple of things to remember about channel bonding is um, while it does give you a higher data rate, it does give you a higher bandwidth, it will, you will also have to use that same amount of output power to cover a wider frequency band, which means your SNR is going to reduce. And roughly, every time you do channel bonding, you reduce your signal-to-noise ratio by 3 decibels. So use channel bonding wisely. And a general rule of thumb is only do channel bonding when you have something called DFS channels available, which we'll talk about later, and when you actually need those data rates. Oftentimes, it's better to have more smaller channels, narrower channels, 20 megahertz channels, and and remove any CCI, any co-channel interference, uh, it would result in a better performing network than having multiple uh, 40 or wider 80 megahertz channels with that higher bandwidth because those will be subject to CCI and it's going to be harder for ACSP to work around those problems and it's also going to be harder to design your networks that way. Uh, so at the time of this training, um, do not implement anything wider than a 40 megahertz channel. That would be a general recommendation. A couple of things to remember here. So unless you have DFS enabled, on 5 gigahertz you will only have, uh, in Europe you only have um, four or maybe eight, depending on which country you're in and whether they have implemented Uni3. So you only have four or eight non-overlapping 5 gigahertz channels because that DFS block is going to be blocked out. Um, you need to enable DFS manually uh, for to open up the other channels. And the other thing to note is, so Uni3 in North America has been around for a, quite a while, so all the client devices already know about that channel plan. 
in the European Union, uh, the Uni3 has only been released very recently. And if you have a client device that didn't have its firmware upgraded for a very long period of time, it might not be aware that those channels are available, which as a consequence might mean that your clients cannot see those channels that your A access points are using, which means you have holes in your coverage. So a couple of things. Um, if you want the wider channel plan available, you need to enable DFS support, which is disabled by default. And the second thing is, in some cases, it's actually better to disable the Unifree channels if you're somewhere in Europe, in EMEA, because uh, even though it's nice to have those additional four channels, it may cause problems because your clients haven't been updated yet. And one of the ways to quickly find out what kind of clients you have and how, what kind of channel plan they support is by going to your client 360 view and you'll be able to see the maximum capabilities of the clients in your network and quickly identify whether or not they actually support these channels. And that will give you a good feedback uh, whether or not to keep this uni-free channel band on or off. So the client 360 view will quickly enable you to identify uh, what kind of channel plan your client device is actually supporting, regardless of your infrastructure. Uh, if you need to turn this off, there's a quick and easy way to do it in a radio profile. You just check disable uni-free channels uh, radio button and that will disable the uni-3 for all of your access points. And very similarly, you would enable or disable DFS in very much the same way. So you heard the term DFS, dynamic frequency selection, mentioned a couple of times. Well, dynamic frequency selection is a mechanism that needs to be enabled. Uh, it's mandatory by law uh, on devices communicating in the UNI2 and UNI2 extended frequency bands. Uh, that's why I said if you don't have DFS support, then you only, you're only stuck with either four or eight uh, channels in Europe or in, you're stuck with nine channels, nine non-overlapping 5 gigahertz channels in the US. Um, the DFS is there to protect devices like weather radars, uh, radars used by ports or airports um, and military uh, to basically detect uh, weather. And uh, these radars will normally um, use very short blasts on this frequency space to um, measure radar. And if, if a radar blast is detected by an AP or any device in this frequency space, it needs to move away from this channel. So it needs to move away, um, let the radar finish its work, and then come back to the channel. And it needs to move away to one of the channels that are not in the DFS range. So any Wi-Fi radio operating in this, or actually any device operating in these frequency uh, bands, needs to support DFS. Um, otherwise, you might be in breach of the law and uh, you might be prosecuted and fined um, for not respecting uh, the DFS rules. The, there's a feature available in our wireless cloud APs, which is called uh, Zero Weight DFS where you can dedicate one of the RX and TS change to constantly measure the uh, DFS frequency range. And by default, the time that the access point needs to spend off the DFS channel is 30 minutes. By enabling that feature, you can sacrifice one of the TX and RX change. You sacrifice one spatial stream so that that radio chain is constantly measuring the, the DFS bands, and when the radar goes away, the access point can immediately return to those channels, opening up those non-overlapping uh, channels quickly, quicker than those 30 minutes. 